we believe that we can, uh, you know, help corporates work with startups and we can create value for the startups by getting them commercial contracts with um, big corporates, we didn't know if that was going to work. And we went out and talked to people. And our first program, we ended up working with BMW and Heinz and Stella and Panasonic. And that really was a testament to the, the appetite for this kind of way of working, even though it was relatively new and no one knew how and if it was going to work. Um, and we had a room about this size and we put these four brands in this room with about 50 entrepreneurs. And it was just the most incredible day. We'd literally had this big space, signed a lease on it. We were having the carpet put in and the Wi-Fi put in the day that they all arrived. Um, and we ran a program that was very, very successful. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I've been chatting to a lot of people here and obviously for corporates to innovate, there are lots and lots of challenges and some of them wonder why they're doing it and obviously there are good reasons and, you know, there is a school of thought that says, you know, if you don't start innovating some of these big companies, you are going to die. Um, but we, we love companies that are in that space. You know, when Ollie was asking people who their dream clients were, and obviously for some people it's an Apple or a Google, we like working with some of these big legacy companies that really, really need to do this and really need to find new ways of doing things and move their businesses on and start working a lot more um, with some of the smartest people in the world, and that can be transformational. Um, but, you know, there's a, there, one of the challenges is that, you know, and this has become the new kind of, I guess, dinner party conversation, valuations of startups. You know, we all look at unicorns, the awful word as it is, but we look at the valuations of startups and the money that they get and the amount of capital in the world and say, surely, surely these companies aren't worth, you know, $70 billion or whatever, and they don't make any money. And yet Mr. Corporate over here, you know, they make a profit and they're valued at 15 to 20 times their earnings. And yet these companies are valued based on what? But, you know, the, the corporates, um, you know, are really vul vulnerable to these companies, and, but they find it so hard to innovate. And obviously, you know, we've heard mention, you know, the Innovator's Dilemma and um, those kind of books that lay out, you know, why Kodak failed and everything and things that become intrinsically ingrained in the right way to run businesses actually are the counter to innovation often. often. And, you know, well-run businesses are incentivized to be efficient and not take risk. And, you know, innovation equates risk in lots of people's mind. It equates expense. And, um, you know, and corporates have become less attractive to people in the world who can go and work at some of these glamorous startups and be paid more money and get stock options. So, you know, it's a, it's a tough challenge. If you can't get the talent, what do you do and how do you make these things happen? And if you've got a board that won't release budget or a very risk averse, how do you make that work? So, you know, we've come up with a model that helps solve some of those problems. Um, you know, and the, the Silicon Valley game is, is a different one. VCs are coming and they're playing by a different set of rules. They're not incentivized by the share price. They're incentivized, you know, they're incentivizing their companies to grow and failure is built into the system. They're expecting the majority of their portfolio companies to fail spectacularly, but they know that one of them or two of them will be hugely, hugely successful and make the gains back for all the rest of the failures. And they're not motivated by short-term profit. They just want to own markets. And that's really, really, really challenging. And when you look at valuations and of these companies and say, well, they're going to fail, or and they, these valuations can't be justified, you know, you have to start thinking differently and starting to realize the game that's being played. You know, and then you look at corporates and you say, well, they have, you know, these sensible valuations, but actually, if they don't get some of these fundamental models and aren't innovative and don't understand the power of the internet and digital marketing and how transformational that can be, they're going to get disrupted by, you know, these startups. And, you know, if you're thinking that a 15 to 20 times earnings ratio means that you're going to assume, 
you're going to get that kind of the same kind of cash and profit for 15 or 20 years. A lot of these companies that might not even last that long if they don't do things differently. Um, and Dave McClure from 500 Startups, it's a you know a big accelerator in America, said you know unless corporates dinosaurs innovate more rapidly. Um, you can expect most dinosaurs to be disrupted and destroyed by an endless march of VC-funded unicorns that will bash their tiny little reptile brains in with software and internet marketing. And uh, that kind of sums it up pretty neatly. I don't think there's any doubt what he's trying to say there. Um, and the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, you know, in the last few months has said, you know, Silicon Valley's coming. There are hundreds of startups with a lot of brains and money working on various alternatives to traditional banking. And... The commonality between those things is that they both talk about brains. <laughs> and uh, One talks about lots of brains, the other talk about having small brains. And, you know, these companies have uh, a lot of cash, they have a lot of people, they have a lot of smart people. How can these businesses leverage this power? How can they access this? How can they compete? So corporates do have some advantages. Uh, you know, they do have, a lot of them have large amounts of capital on their balance sheets. They have expert knowledge and data in their businesses and R&D budgets you know do far exceed VC funds you know 2014 the combined US and European R&D budgets were like 450 billion compared to 80, 86 billion dollars worth of venture capital so you think well there must be a way of deploying this capital well for these corporates to start winning um, but they have to start thinking differently maybe about how they're deploying it and deploying portions of it. And what we've done is we've evolved this model, which I'm not going to talk through because it's a very boring chart, but this kind of maps out some of what we've learned and the stages and processes that we take corporates through in order to help them work with these early stage startups and leverage the power of them. And, you know, it's a process that helps de-risk innovation, it helps um, corporates identify the right challenges and opportunities, it creates an environment that this stuff can really, really work and take off and allow them to trial and test and learn from doing lots and lots of things. So I just was going to go through seven things, seven sounds like a good number, so I thought I'd do seven. Um, and these are the things, some of the things that we've learned along the way. Um, uh, you know, obviously before lunch we saw a plethora of amazing startup technologies from all kinds of different sectors, which was like incredible. And they're the sorts of companies that we look at and we introduce and we find ways of making them work. And our process helps corporates leverage those kind of amazing technologies. But there are things that we've learned and they're kind of like our mantras or a manifesto for doing this. And they're little things and that we've learned along the way and beliefs that that we have. So obviously the first one leads on really from, you know, the, the things I've been saying, you know, software is eating the world, you know, it's something obviously Mark Andreessen said it about five years ago. It's, you know, it's the, the, the story of our time. It's changing everything we do. It's changing the way we shop, you know, the way that we travel, the way that we interact with our friends, with the way we socialize, you know, everything about our lives is changing because of technology. Everything, the way we do businesses, the way we run businesses is changing because of technology. And, you know, that's a problem for, for, for big old corporate businesses, you know, that, that new people can come along and do what they did faster, cheaper, quicker without all the hindrance of the, of the past and the baggage that they've built up that actually used to be a competitive advantage. You know, having distribution and manufacturing and large marketing were, you know, defences to people, but... You know, software now can can get around all those things, you know, much, much quicker and cheaper. So the defensibility the corporates had in the past is gone and, you know, they have to start um, using software better and smarter, whether it's through marketing, whether it's new products and services, whether it's, you know, efficiencies in their business. Um, it's massively important for them to do that. You know, we think that... Corporates need to start thinking more like entrepreneurs, you know, start learning from the way that they do new, learn and do new products, that they test quickly and they fail fast and all these things that, you know, are, are buzzwords that, that we hear every day but people don't really live and are counter to the way that a lot of corporates are set up, you know, but... 
build our process builds this in. It builds in entrepreneurial thinking. It, it ingrains it in corporate cultures and gives them a way of doing stuff fast with other people and leveraging that power. Um, again, think big, start small. It's a classic corporate problem. You know, they want to do big things. They, they're all about doing big stuff. They've currently got big products and services. Why would they do small stuff? And again, this is laid out in the innovator's dilemma and stuff, you know, that, um, you know, corporates only are interested in big stuff and that when um, someone at Kodak invented the digital camera, the board said, well, pff, like, don't tell anyone, you know, as if no one else was going to go and invent it, you know, and the, the market for that must be tiny. I mean, you don't know anyone that's bought a digital camera. It's like, well, obviously the market doesn't exist yet. So you have to be prepared to start doing small things and learning from small things and that, you know, we, we've met CEOs and... Uh, you know, senior management teams that, you know, they, they want disruption day one. They want disruptive technology. And that isn't how disruption happens. You know, innovation, when it's proven and scaled, can be disruptive, but it doesn't disrupt day one. And that can be a long process to get there. Um, understanding risk, you know, risk it, you know, is perceived as a bad thing, but if done right and managed well, Risk can, you know, help you win. The way that investors um, invest and a lot of accelerators work, and a lot of VCs invest, it's all about spread betting on lots and lots of um, different possibilities to give you the opportunity for uh, different outcomes. And you have to start playing some of those games, taking lots and lots of small bets. It doesn't have to be big bets. You know, don't do one big bet. Do lots and lots of small things and... Um, get rid of the ones that are failing quickly and double down on the ones that are winning. You know, there's a thing, when you think you're doing the safe thing, you're actually doing the dangerous thing and you have to be prepared to take risk but do it in a managed way. Don't just go and, like, spend a million pounds on doing one thing. Take that money and do lots of small things effectively and quickly and learn. And this is one of the biggest things, and I guess it's fundamental to what we do. We're all about getting corporates to work with smart people from anywhere in the world. And, the, you know, they're saying no one has the best talent in the building, you know, not even Google. You, um, you know that open source software has opened up um, development of new operating systems and new software and technology to people from around the world and that you can reach those people. Network is a powerful thing and it's a competitive advantage and the internet actually allows you to leverage that. It allows you to reach people in places that you wouldn't have otherwise and work with them. And we work with companies that are from everywhere. We work with companies from South America, from Eastern Europe, from China, from uh, America, etc. cetera. And, um, you know, that is, is really, really incredibly powerful for people to be able to do that and find things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Um, alignment of incentives, again, really, really fundamental. Like, if you're going to get two parties working together, you need to make sure that they're both vested in the outcomes. Like, when you go as a corporate and you engage an agency to build you something, they're not vested in the outcome like you are, and they are often vested in billing you more money and more hours. So their incentive is to keep their, their staff employed, not to necessarily deliver you the best thing qu as quickly as possible. They're not incentivized necessarily to challenge your thinking. If they come along, if someone comes along and says, build me this for a million pounds, are you gonna say, why would you do that? You know, you're gonna say, thanks very much, give me the million pounds. But startups that are incentivized in the right way, and that's not even necessarily about money. When you actually start talking to the corporate and the startup about what they actually want out of a relationship, it's often not about money. It might be that the startup really, really wants access to the expert knowledge, data, and insight that a corporate can provide them. It might be that they want access to other relationships. It might be that they want a channel of distribution. It might be they want customer acquisition. If you can unearth what people really want 
actually make sure that people can deliver it, then that becomes incredibly powerful. And we have developed a, a, a thing that we call the win-win term sheet. And we put that in front of both parties and get them to fill it out to understand what their true motivation is and what success looks like and what will you know, ultimately motivate them, drive them forward. Some entrepreneurs that you meet, they're doing this stuff for passion. You know, They're doing it because they love it. They might have some amazing backstory that's led them to be doing this thing and they will make it happen one way or the other. And you, if you can harness the power of that, that that's amazing. Uh, and the last one, uh, embrace diversity. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, thinking that, you know, it's very inward looking. It's very, you know, there's people that talk about uh, com pattern recognition and, you know, you need to look outside of what you know. You need to look outside of the things that you uh, interact with every day. You need to look outside of your existing customers. You need to look outside of your existing workforce and finding people with a different view of the world and a different experience, again, can give you that extra bit of insight or competitive edge that will make the difference. So, you know, you need to be really, really open to people that don't necessarily look like you, speak the same language, come from the same place. And I think that over the next, you know, 20 or 30 years, I think that a lot of interesting things are going to come out of places that we don't even expect. Obviously, there's a concentration of wealth and money and power in places like Silicon Valley. I think that, you know, things will start coming out of interesting other places uh, in the world. Um, and that's it. I didn't even mention robots coming to take people's jobs. So. <laughs> <laughs>